Well, good morning to all of you and welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm Ashley Tellis, I'm a senior fellow here at the Endowment and it's a special pleasure to welcome all of you to Chris Fair's uh, book discussion, her newest book, Inside the Mind of lashkar e uh, Chris works at Georgetown now. She's the Distinguished Associate Professor in the Security Studies Program. But I've had the pleasure of knowing Chris for at least 20 years since we were both at the Rand Corporation in a world that seems very, very far away and a long ago. Uh, she worked at Rand uh, as a senior political scientist. She, after Rand, she went to the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan and then came back to Washington to work at the US Institute of Peace before uh, her current position at Georgetown. As all of you know, uh, those of you who follow South Asia security issues, uh, she's written uh, two great books, well, many more, but two great books. One, uh, The Pakistan Army's Way of War, which was the book published before the current one that we're going to discuss today, and this volume, Inside the Mind of Lashkar e Taiba. Now, ever since the attacks in Bombay, Lashkar e Taiba has sort of grown large in our political consciousness. But this book is very interesting because it doesn't focus merely on Lashkar e Taiba's international profile, but rather looks at its roots within Pakistan, uh, a study of its po political sociology, uh, the way it is grafted into uh, the Pakistani state, and the challenges that it poses uh, to Pakistani society as Pakistan uh, meets the challenges of groups such as lashkar e -Taiba. And so this book comes at lashkar e -Taiba from a very different perspective from much of the standard international relations literature, and so I thought it would be a very useful uh, exercise to have a discussion on this book today. We are joined by two uh, distinguished scholars who are going to follow Chris after her presentation in offering their comments on the book before we open up the floor to a discussion. And to Chris's right is Polly Nayak, who is now with the South Asia program at the Stimson Center, but spent a career uh, in the US intelligence community. Uh, she was, in fact, the South Asia manager and its senior most expert for at least six years. And I think she uh, was the president's daily briefer for longer than probably she wants to remember. So she has a great familiarity with the issue and with the subject that we are going to discuss today. And to the furthest right is Josh White, who is now associate professor of South Asian studies at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Josh served at the White House as the senior advisor and director for South Asian affairs at the National Security Council. And if memory serves me right, was actually witness to one of the major crises that we had in India-Pakistan relations as a result of terrorist attacks. So both from the theoretical side, from the academic side, and from the policy practitioner side, this panel has covered all bases. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Chris to spend a few minutes walking us through the thesis of the book, and then I'm going to invite Josh and Polly to offer remarks before we open the floor to a conversation. So thank you very much for coming this morning. The logistics of changing slides. I'm wearing, can I just switch places with Josh? And I, can I think you can do the, it from here. The thing is, I'm blind. Ah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've been can blind forever. Do it from there? Is it okay if I can switch places Absolutely. with you? That Absolutely. way I can see that. Absolutely, sure. I've got one of those. I have, it's like my vision and my ears are really lousy and I'm not deaf enough for hearing aids and my glasses don't correct my vision. So I'm in that terrible zone of getting old but not old enough. Okay, so um, actually, thank you, Ashley. Uh, Ashley was my first mentor at the Rand Corporation. I think the first project that we did was that lovely Unical project, which we've got lots of stories about. That was a fun project. <laughs> and Ashley, Ashley introduced me to Polly many years ago um, on another project that Ashley and I got to work on, on Cargill. And then Josh. Josh has been, it's just really fun to see Josh 
I don't know, when you came as a graduate student, you were so smart and you had spent so much time in Pakistan. <laughs> And now you're thoroughly suited and booted. <laughs> and I'm the only one on this panel that's escaped government service, alhamdulillah, which means that um, I have the luxury of saying things without any impact whatsoever. <laughs> so I will indulge that luxury liberally this morning. All right, so when I began this project, um, it's, it actually began very similarly to the Pakistan Army project, which is with the Pakistan Army, you just kind of notice this pattern, right? That it keeps doing what it's doing, even though it's not working and it's even detrimental. So for me, that was the puzzle. When I began studying Lushkar Taiba, also incidentally, back uh, when I was at the Rand Corporation, um, I had been collecting their materials since I was a student, but like every humanity student that spent time in Pakistan, I didn't really understand the importance of the materials that I had gathered until many years later. But I noticed that the Lashkar Taiba would, let's say they trained 10 people. Only one or fewer would actually get deployed to Kashmir. Now this is, from, a, from an institutional point of view, this is really a strange puzzle, right? Because this is also a principal agent problem. You train 10 dudes that want to blow up stuff, and you only let one go and blow up stuff. What are the other nine doing, right? And the one thing that you'll observe about Lashkar Taiba is that it's never done anything within Pakistan itself. So organizations, I, you know, I kind of ground myself more in the sort of the logic of, of labor, uh, labor economics. You don't invest in human capital that's going to bite back at you unless it's giving you some kind of advantage. So this became my puzzle. How do we explain these unusual personnel policies of this organization? So I don't think I need to uh, tell you guys, I think everyone looking at this audience, does anyone not know the origins of these folks? Okay, all right, so let me just say very briefly, there is a perception that the ISI created this organization. It's a very similar perception that the ISI created the Taliban. This isn't really the case. The Taliban um, had its own origins, as did Lashkar Taiba. I think of Pakistan sort of as a petri dish, right? Um, if you were a, a biologist in the 18th century and you were looking for critters that, that might be curative, put a bunch of junk in a petri dish and see what grows and see what you can utilize. Pakistan is like a petri dish in the sense that militant organizations are constantly cropping up, their ISI gets involved and they either get cropped down or they get propped up or they get instrumentalized or the, or the, the, the deep state has a, uh, a fluctuating relationship. So the ISI did not make the LET, but once the LET came on its radar screen, the timing was propitious and the ISI invested in it. So I'm just going to try to um, summarize these, uh, the next several slides here. So the basic story of the LET goes like this. Um, uh, a couple of fellows, many of whom are, are quite well known, uh, they meet, like for example, Lakfi, Hafiz, Saeed, they meet in Afghanistan. They both share in common a particular interpretation of the LA Hadith, which is a particular interpretive tradition of Islam. Um, Hafiz Saeed, he has an organization that's mostly about uh, tablig, about converting people to their mission. Um, I think that the best way of explaining this to an audience that doesn't know a lot about um, tablig uh, would be like the mitzvah mobile in New York. In other words, they're, they're they're reaching out to co-religionists, but they're trying to get them to do things differently in a way in which the organization thinks is proper. Lakfi, he has a militia, right? So he's actually there at the very end of the anti-Soviet jihad trying to contribute. But they're a little bit late to the party. So it's like the, you know, the lady in the prom dress shows up late and her, her date's already drunk. So that's kind of L.E.T. Um, so they merge. But the one thing that you learn when you start studying L.E.T. is that L.E.T., from the beginning, ab initio, does not believe in participating in intra-Muslim conflicts. And as the Soviets withdrew and there was no longer the great enemy to fight, L.E.T. 
decided that there's no point staying. This doesn't fit. And there's a, actually a really interesting episode when uh, a L.A. Hadith warlord wanted their intervention, and they said, no, thank you. And that's sort of narrated in the book. But if you go and you look at the map at the same time period, you'll see that things are happening in Kashmir. Pakistan, from 1947 onward, had been trying to instigate and foment problems in Kashmir. They finally succeed after Indian um, uh, malfeasance in the domestic politics of Kashmir. And Pakistan finally has this opportunity. We also know, by the way, that Zia, when he was investing in the different jihadi groups, he only invested in those groups that would have utility in the Kashmir dispute. So by, by the early 1990s, the Pakistanis in Kashmir are playing these different groups off of each other, right? So first you've got the JKLF. Turns out they're not really interested in Pakistan and they're not quite Islamist enough. Then you have Hizbul Mujahideen. The problem with Hizbul Mujahideen is they're not vicious enough, right? Because they're largely Kashmiri. And so they're not able to perpetrate the spectacularly vicious violence that Pakistan believes it needs. Enter LET, right? So LET happens to come online at a time that's very useful for the Pakistani state as it's trying to manage these different assets. One word that you probably won't hear, there's two words that you're not gonna hear me use in this discussion. I hate, 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 hate the word radicalization. Because as soon as we call someone radical or radicalized, we stop thinking about their objective, rational interest in joining an organization. So I abjure this word, except when an editor makes me use it, and then, you know, if anyone has battled with an editor, you know the editor always wins. If you want to get your thing published, um, Jonathan Landay saying no, but, you know, Jonathan Landay's special. But for the rest of us plebes here who are academics, <laughs> editors often win, um, especially if you want to get tenure, right? Editors are going to win. Um, the other thing that you're not going to hear me use is the word terrorist. By the way, it's not because I think it's a bad word and because I'm a tree hugger. I'm not. It says when we use the word terrorist, it gives us the impression that this is a, a, a sui generis actor pursuing his or sometimes her, in this case always his, agenda. The reason why I tend to not use terrorist in describing this organization is that I don't want you to forget that this is actually a proxy of the Pakistani state. Right? It is not a non-state actor. It is a state actor. When Pakistan looks at how it wants to prosecute its foreign policy objectives, this organization, like Jaish al-Muhammad, is a part of the order of battle. So do they engage in terrorism? Absolutely. But I want to remind you that this is a proxy of the Pakistani state and that the state uses this organization for very rational reasons. I, I put this map up here just to, to give you a sense. While most of the operations that this organization conducts uh, have taken place in Indian-administered Kashmir, as Pakistan's nuclear umbrella has unfurled, it became more brazen and began conducting attacks elsewhere in India. It also has been conducting attacks in Afghanistan, which was a move that it had really resisted. But I, if, if you're interested in the organizational discussions uh, that went into them conducting attacks uh, in Afghanistan. I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A. But it also uses this extended neighborhood for what I'm going to call bureaucratic or back office logistics, right? So if you need to get a, a, some fake, a fake passport and some fake visas, uh, you might go to Thailand to do that. There's a lot of interesting discussion about what they are or not doing with the Rohingya in Myanmar and Bangladesh. I've been studying that. I think there's more smoke and mirrors than actual people on the ground, but it's a very effective way for them to raise money. We also know that they raise money from the Gulf, but they also raise money from the diaspora. So for example, the United Kingdom, um, Mirpuri's there, they already, I mean, they're, they're already very politically engaged by this issue. So really the whole world is their back office, even though operationally, they stay focused mostly on India and to some extent uh, in, Cob uh, in Afghanistan. And I, as I said, you will not find a single attack by this organization in Pakistan. For those of you that don't pay attention to the alphabet soup, the Pakistanis love to take advantage of organizations having similar names. So some people will say, well, what about the cricket attack in 2000? The, the, remember the Sri Lankan cricketers? That was Lushkar Ajangvi, a totally different organization. So don't get your Lushkars confused. The Pakistanis bank on people getting confused. OK, so one thing I'd like to point out, and um, 
these are some of the most notorious operations. If we were to look at the fatality yield, this is one of the most effective killing machines in Pakistan's arsenal. But what I want you to think about is what's the cost effectiveness of this instrument. So I'm gonna show you some slides um, in, the, in, in, the, in a few minutes, but let me just walk you through them here. If you look at the human capital, what we know about the human capital of these Lushkars, they fall somewhere in between an NCO and the Pakistan military and someone who could qualify for the Pakistan Military Academy, right? But unlike someone that would go in the army, either as an officer or as a jawan, these guys cost very little in the end, right? Because if you're anyone looking at the Indian budget, Indian defense budget, where, does, where do most of the monies go? In pensions, right? Same thing is true in the Pakistan army, except they've been very clever. They move their pensions over to the civilian budget so they can do some magical wizard math so they don't run afoul of the World Bank. With LET, they don't have that, right? So they're getting the same kind of human capital. They're getting the same kind of operational capabilities without this huge infrastructure to support the soldier and their family. So if you were to just monetize the attack, you know, per attacker, this is extremely cost effective. And you're still getting a similar quality of violence at a very lower price point, right? So this is economically very efficient. Uh, it also has, of course, the benefit of plausible deniability. And even while deniability has declined in recent years, Pakistan still has not borne the price of these activities. Right, and that's another policy debate that maybe Josh, Ashley, and Polly can explain because to me, it's just infuriating. All right, so the one thing I do want you to understand, um, and this is a, a graph that very heavily simplifies it. When you start looking at these organizations and how they market each other, they pay attention to their ideology. So back at RAND, I used to work on military manpower uh, and in recruitment. And so there'd be this constant debate. Should we just run, remember you know, the Got Milk campaign where all the different dairy producers, they, they put their money together and they say drink milk. Why drink milk? Well, because Pepsi is there, right? So you wanna put all your resources together to brand a concept rather than a particular brand, right? So one debate in the military recruitment literature was why do we have ads for the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, Marines, plus the Guard and all the reserve components? All we're really doing is raising the price of any given recruit as opposed to expanding recruits, right? So what you will see is that at some level, these organizations do very similar things, right? They will have these powwows where they're talking about the virtues of jihad, right? But when it comes time to getting you to sign on the dotted line, because they actually do have personnel um, strategies that are, that are quite regularized, as my colleague Jake Shapiro has documented in his book, The Terrorist Dilemma. When it comes to you signing on the dotted line, not only do they want you to kill on command, they, all, you want, they also want you to embrace their worldview. And this is very important for Lashkar Taiba because it is what you call Germokalid. It rejects all interpretive traditions or fiqh. And even though Pakistan doesn't ever ask this question in a census, we believe them to be about 5% or less in Pakistan's population. What's also important about Lashkar Taiba, unlike the other groups, is that their Ulama, their religious scholars, are at odds with other LA Hadith scholars in Pakistan who do not believe that non-state actors can wage jihad. This means that, unlike other organizations that we're going to talk about, say the Deobandis, they can't simply draw upon the mosques and madrasas as an intellectual and financial infrastructure. Right? So this, from an ISI's point of view, makes them much more vulnerable because they don't have access to this extensive funding network that competitive militant organizations enjoy, most notably the Dale Bundys. And Josh, what's the status of your book? On its way. Inshallah. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned. Josh, Josh is gonna Josh is hitting the market with a book for which there is no precedent. He is actually looking at the guts of the Dale Bundys. You know, Vali Nasser has looked at Jamaat, I looked at these guys. The Dale Bundys have the biggest market share of killers in Pakistan and in the region. And unlike LET, there's an archipelago of mosques and madrasas and, a and you know, multiple factions of the political party that it can free ride off of. LET doesn't have any of those. And that's why I've 
drawn these as I have. This blue thing in the middle are all of these Dale Bundy organizations. They have overlapping missions, they have overlapping manpower, and they have overlapping institutions from which they get money. Um, and then it is these Dale Bundy organizations, both at the institutional and organizational levels that are contributing manpower, first to Al-Qaeda and now to ISIS. LET, although in principle it has much more in common with, with um, Al Qaeda, because it is Al Qaeda's Salafi, and these guys are uh, Germa Khalid, which are not exactly the same, but they're similar. The Dale Bundys, for historical reasons, have always had closer ties to Al Qaeda. So you'll remember back in 1998, if you were watching this then, when Clinton sent cruise missiles into Khost, we didn't kill Al Qaeda, but we killed Dale Bundys and we killed some of their ISI handlers. And it was because of that proximity, remember the Afghan Taliban, their Dale Bundy, that those relationships were forged. In Afghanistan, LET always had its own camps. So it didn't have the, orga the organizational organic ties to Al Qaeda that the Dale Bundys had. So I, when I begin, or when I study these groups, I pay attention to how the organizations are situating themselves ideologically and how they're marketing themselves. And this is very important, um, by the way. Right now, LET is literally at war with ISIS because they don't agree with this notion of takfir, which is declaring a certain Muslim to be a kafir, and often the subsequent uh, determination that they're wajibul qatl. Wajibul qatl not only means that you're worthy to be killed, but the person who kills you is actually doing, uh, it's a boon to kill you, right? So LA, and this is also part of the reason I argue in the book why LA Hadith is so important to the Pakistani state, because no matter how terrible you might be as a Muslim, they can't kill you. They're very clear about this. They use the word kalima go. As long as you have said the kalima and you recognize that Allah is the highest authority, you can't be killed. The only way to respond to you and your behavior is through dawah and tabligh. And so this is obviously in stark contrast to the Dale Bundys. And once um, I worked through very carefully their minimum opus, hum kyon jihad ka this became very apparent. They say very explicitly, um, in fact, it's an interesting document. Um, I, the follow-up to this book, I'm, it's an edited volume of all the translations of the stuff I use here. In this minimum opus, it starts out with a questioner asking a wise, a, a wise jihadi, why are we waging jihad in Pakistan? Pakistan has all of these problems. Why are we waging this external jihad? So it, it's, it plays out in a Socratic method, but basically arguing why Pakistan cannot be a place of jihad. And to go back to my Indiana roots, my mama would say, you don't pee in your own bathtub. They're not peeing in their bathtub. But there's also a reason for this. Their, their argument in Hamkyong Jihad Kadrahe is that until, well, they make the argument that the, the Ummah began to decline when it stopped engaging in offensive jihad. So there is, jihad is instrumental in bringing back the, 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 the greater qualities of the Ummah, but there's also a more near-term explanation, and they're very clear about this. They say that when we stop engaging in the external jihad, which is killing the Kufar, mostly in India, we will turn on ourselves, right? And we will no longer be the beacon for Muslims in South Asia or elsewhere, right? And so this is, in a nutshell, why LET is so important to the Pakistani state. It, not only is it an effective killer outside of India, it is a very important organization within. So if some of you are asking, as I'm, I'm asked all the time, they're constantly under pressure to do something about this organization, but yet they continue to grow it. They continue to sponsor Jamaat al-Dawa. They continue to grow its other humanitarian organizations. The reason is they want this organization to spread its mission domestically. And I've actually done survey work, and I can demonstrate to you the rebranding effort that the Pakistani state undertook when LET flipped over to Jamaat al Dawa. Most Pakistanis now think of this as an organization that works within Pakistan, whereas LET only works in Kashmir. So this branding effort has been very successful, as my data show. Happy to talk more about this, because this is really the, the nuts and bolts of the book, is this domestic utility, not so much the external utility, which people like Stephen Tankle and Ashley and others um, have uh, written about at length. This is an artifact that I want to show you. So my PhD is in the humanities. I'm not a political scientist. Um, and that's important to me, because it means I, I privilege different kinds of evidence differently. So Stephen Tankle uses a lot of interviews. 
I don't use interviews in this book because I have found that people either don't know, they don't remember because they're human, or they're not telling the truth. Um, I, had, I was in a meeting with a, a very, I won't say his name, his initials are SC, and he's written a book uh, which is basically a bromance about the ISI. And he said, and it was the most extraordinary thing, that uh, Lushkar Taiba told him that ISI is no longer giving them money. And after I, you know, borked my, my, my tea, I said, they, they didn't tell you that. A, they wouldn't tell you that. I, I, I wasn't there, but I know they didn't tell you that. A, they would never admit that, right? Because admitting that would be fairly serious. Two, the dude you met doesn't know English. And he barely speaks Urdu, because his Urdu sounds exactly like Punjabi, and I speak both, and I can barely understand him because he speaks such a eight Punjabi, which means that your translator told you that, right? So I don't... I don't rely upon this stuff because even with the best of intentions, and I, whether or not there was the best intentions in this case, I, I can't say. But what I can say is this individual then went off to write some very important articles and brief some very important people in a very important administration about a thing that could not have possibly have been true, right? And he didn't have the linguistic skills to understand that. But he should have had enough, I don't know, as my former boxing trainer used to say, on the corner shit. I mean, OCS as he called it. He should have used his OCS to figure out. No one would ever say that from this organization. But this artifact, I think it's quite, kind of illustrates my point, right? This is a business card of Yahya Mujahid, whom I used to meet fairly frequently. He loves a pro-continental. He loves, love, loves it. But you can see here, if, 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 and I've, I've put this on my website, I've published this in multiple places, it's got his uh, phone and fax numbers. They, apparently, they still use fax. Uh, in all of these different cities, Islamabad, Mirpur, Muzaffarabad, Peshawar, Quarta, Multan, and Karachi. Right? So this is within Pakistan, an organization which is very available. You can call them. You can meet with them. They're very open, right? which is not something you'd expect for an organization that's been prescribed by the UN Security Council. And this sort of speaks to my earlier point is that the, the deep state wants them to be circulating like this within Pakistan. So let's talk about my data. I think data is important so you understand how I think about data, and therefore you can critique my use of data. Uh, a lot of data that relies upon these kinds of biographies suffer from different kinds of biases. And I think it's important we discuss them um, right off the bat. First, to end up my database, you have to be dead. Right? So this is, by the way, this is very important if you're Lashkar Taiba. Let, let's take Ajmal Kassab. He failed in his most important duty, which was to die. And because the dude did not die, we know a lot about the deep state's assistance to this organization. We know that a frogman taught them to swim. If you've ever been to Pakistan, very few Pakistanis swim. Uh, the Na if you talk to someone in the Navy, they will tell you that the operations that they did at sea are things that are very, very complicated. To take folks who are essentially hydrophobic <laughs> and to teach them to do those operations, changing multiple craft at high sea, this isn't trivial, right? We know these things because Kassab failed to die, right? So this is very important because this tells me that these are the folks who are most dedicated to what they were tasked to do, which was kill and then get killed rather than being taken hostage. The other thing that we learn um, from reading these biographies is that the people that end up in this database, they're organizational entrepreneurs. So when my brothers went to Iraq, they didn't say, hey, big army, send me to Iraq, right? There was no organizational lobbying. In fact, you know, if you wanted to get out of Iraq, you had to be an organizational entrepreneur, right? Say, oh, I beat my wife or I'm gay, because in those days that totally worked. Um, instead, all you had to do was be a battle qualified soldier in the inventory of big army and have a pulse and you went. I mean, we even sent people like from the Navy to go to Afghanistan, right? We, any, anyone who had a pulse uh, at some point rotated through these battle spaces. This isn't true with these guys because they have at their disposal a much larger base of trained people than they will ever need. So what we see in these biographies is this constant begging, you know, I've done this training, why haven't I been deployed? Someone who, who did their training uh, well after me has already been deployed. And to Department of Treasury folks, I've been saying this for years. You keep saying, where's the evidence that Hafez Saeed does this crap? I have biographies. And by the way, these are published by Hafez Saeed's own in-house press. So it would be like me running a terrorist organization, having a magazine called Terrorist Weekly, in which I talked about my sending terrorists, that I bless this terrorist. 
I told him which place he was going to go and be a terrorist. And I'm like, sorry, I have no responsibility. Right? And this would be implausible at face value. But we have biographies where Hafiz Saeed himself is the one that undertakes a decision to let this person go forward. Hafez Saeed himself picks the target that he is going to operate against, right? So we see in this a lot of bureaucratic entrepreneurialism. And let's also remember, operationally, for them to end up in my database, there's barriers that are constantly imposing barriers for quality. So for example, getting into India, just getting in, the duffers are getting weeded out because they're not getting in, either because they chicken out or because they get shot. Right? If they do multiple operations, they may have to exfiltrate and infiltrate multiple times, and plus be vetted repeatedly through each of these operations, because maybe you've been turned by the Indians. So all of this is by way to say that when I, the data that I'm about to present about these fellows cannot be extended in a facile way to all of the operatives in LET, much as everyone who wants to join. So in other words, this is like looking at the SAT scores of people who not only graduated from Harvard, but went on to be astrophysicists, and comparing it to the scores of the SAT of everyone who took it. Right? This is how many layers of selection I, I believe these fellows have gone through. So it's really important to keep these distinctions in mind. So let's talk a little bit about what this data set says. So the darker, this is a, this is a heat map of where these fellows are recruited from. I have like a little under 1,000 of these guys. The darker the red, the more dense that district is for LET production. If you've seen my book, Fighting to the End, you'll see that there's some similarity, because I have a, I've got similar data for Pak Army recruitment. The, there's many districts that overlap, except um, the Pak Army is more diverse because you also have a lot of recruitment coming from other places where you have cores. So there's a, uh, about 10 districts account for a majority of LET recruitment. One of the reasons why the Punjab is so important, I believe, is because you, when you read their literature, the atrocities of partition loom large. And you see this a lot in the biographies. Like a mother is reticent to give her permission for her son to go, and the son says, but mom, you know, you've told me that when grandma was a little girl, she saw these terrible things, and that one day we should avenge it, and now you're not letting me avenge this. Bad mom, right? And mom's like, oh yeah, you're totally right. What a, what a very you know, perspicacious argument you have advanced. Of course, here's my blessing, now go kill people. So there's a, you'll find in their literature, um, and I think Josh, you, you've done some look at some of their stuff too, in that the thing that we, we did together. But the, the partition looms very large in these publications. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we see this. And of course, there's endogeneity there because the Punjab itself was the most sanguinary site of partition. East. East Pakistan, I mean, what's now East Pakistan, uh, had violence, but nothing on the scale of this. And Steve Wilkinson has some really interesting ideas why. Namely, the overrepresentation of Punjabis in the Great Wars meant that they were very effective managers of violence. So that's one of the hypotheses that he puts forward and he, and he tests it. And I think he, he makes a convincing case. All right, so let's get to the data, right? Remember, I want you to deny all of those caveats that I said. Um, while you may or may not be able to see these numbers, let me just tell you this. Uh, whether we look at all Pakistani males uh, in the Punjab versus everyone else, rural versus urban, the percentage of Pakistani males, and by the way, these numbers are all on my website, christinefair.net. I've got articles where I've, where I've published these numbers. You don't need to photograph them. Um, the, uh, the anywhere between 20% and 36% of Pakistani males are illiterate. In contrast, 1.3% of my fellows are literate. And to sort of get to the chase, very few people, anywhere between 10% and 17%, um, have achieved the, tenth, the, the matriculation of the 10th grade. 44% of my sample has. And we see similar things with intermediate and above. So what's essentially happened you know, if we think about a bell curve, by lopping off all of the doofuses, we're essentially shifting the quality curve, right? So the, the average quality of our LET guy is much higher than the average Pakistani male. Now remember, I can't say that this is true of everyone who wants to join LET, that it's in LET. But of my guys, Pakistan is sending some of its most educated people to engage in violence. Another thing that I found was that these guys tend to be underemployed. 
Now, I don't want the USAID folks to get excited. Oh, if we just give them a job, they'll stop being a terrorist. Uh, what might be going on is that if you want to engage in the intensive training that you have to do to be in this organization, yeah, yeah, but, uh, you need a job that gives you flexibility, right? So the, the, the underemployment might be an artifact of this. So um, I can go on at length. Uh, let me just hop very quickly, because um, Ashley wants me to, to wrap this up. The, the other thing that I found is that whereas most literature on this phenomenon focuses on the individual, LET focuses on the family. Mothers play a very important role. Uh, you will read mothers saying things that, you know, as a sister of soldiers, I, 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 the, first, the first time I read these, I don't cry easily, but I really was just sickened, and I just had to put it down. Mothers would say, I told my son, I don't want you to come home a Ghazi. Ghazi is a veteran. I want you to be a Shaheed. I want you to take a bullet on your chest, right? Things that you can never, it's like the obverse of the nurturing mother, that we want you to go and die. Why do they want you to go and die? They want the status of being a mother of a Shaheed, and they say this very clearly. Also, they believe that their sons can intercede on their behalf, that when he goes to meet Allah, that uh, you know, he can bring mom along. Again, there's a really good way of going to heaven if you're a Muslim, it's just like, be a good Muslim. You don't need to have your son get shot, right? So the one thing that I, I found going through this was this really important role of families and, and LET actively recruiting them. So in the, I'll just take 30 seconds, what's the so what? So having gone through this and combined with the, the book I did on the Pak army, Pakistan has a dilemma, right? It has an army, first of all, it's revisionist, right? It's revisionist for a variety of reasons. It has an army that can start wars but can't win them. It has nuclear weapons that it really can't use, right? So the tool that Pakistan has developed is really using actors like this under its expanding nuclear umbrella to give it impunity. India has a problem. Despite its defense modernization, which is large, it can't defeat Pakistan decisively in a short war. And that's really important, I argue, because you really have to emasculate the army, right? You have to break the army. And India can't do that. It simply cannot do that, because the army that has come up with this ingenious scheme. Would civilians go along with it? Who knows, it's a counterfactual. So from India's point of view, and from American point of view, I see very few tools in our collective or isolated toolbox to make Pakistan stop doing this, right? So you know, our options are really quite limited. If we are unable to muster the collective political will to do what's necessary to this state, and I'm not even sure that we have the ability to do that. We're left with essentially mowing the lawn, right? Now, I think mowing the lawn is important, right? So this particular organization is very vulnerable to leadership decapitation in a way that other organizations aren't because they're very hierarchical. It's not a custom to replacing people when they've been taken out. So I, I end up in the, in the final chapter suggesting that unless we as an international community are unable to put the pressure on Pakistan as we've done for Iran, which is far less dangerous than Pakistan, which is, a, for me, a policy puzzle for the policy types, we really have no choice but to use subconventional means to try to limit the ability of organizations like this to operate. But remember, this isn't the only organization in Pakistan's border battle. Right now, I are, in fact, it's kind of funny, I, I, I ended up being more prescient, and I'm never prescient, I'm really not. I guess got lucky, I had, I had good scotch that night. I argued that we we're probably gonna see more of Jaish in the near term than Lushkar. And the reason is Lushkar is so involved in Pakistan's internal counter-violence strategy that Jaish, for a variety of reasons, is probably gonna be the organization that it's using. So this is also a substitution effect, right? We, we can't just take out a group like Lushkar because it's got other groups that it can deploy. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can I invite you, Josh, to offer a few thoughts? Sure. On this topic? Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with, uh, with friends and mentors, and I would encourage you to go out and buy this book. Uh, Chris has given just, uh, I think, a, a snapshot of some of the key arguments, but it's rich with uh, argumentation and with details that we haven't seen before. 
uh, really, it's really a great work. Just a, a few quick thoughts, having, having read the book and heard the presentation. The first is that I uh, really want to underscore the importance of the sort of theological, ideological argument that Chris presented here, that the book describes the way in which uh, Lashkar e Taiba has a theological architecture that seems almost purpose-built for being a state proxy. It's one that says that no matter what the Pakistani state and its Muslim leaders do, they deserve to be corrected but not attacked. And it, it directs the energies of the population against the Hindu threat. And the way in which this is unpacked, I think, is, is very sophisticated, but it's important because it reminds us that the ideology of the group really binds it to the state in a special way and makes the state presume, uh, be able to make presumptions about the loyalty of the group in a special way because of the very sort of elaborate theological architecture and reasoning that has to be put forward to explain why it is that even the most seemingly irreligious Muslim leader in Pakistan does not deserve to be attacked in the way that um, the neighboring <laughs> Hindus do. So I think that's a very important uh, outcome uh, from, from this research. The second is that it, it really made me think about uh, a longstanding discussion or even debate that we've had within the sort of US government um, and sort of other circles about how to deal with a group like Lashkar e Taiba. And the debate is whether to focus principally on the uh, the militant or terrorist activities at the operational activities at the core of the group, or whether also to spend much time and attention and potentially risk engaging the seemingly benign penumbra of political <coughs> activities or public activities, right? The, uh, the institutions, the rallies, the, the publishing, the recruitment, the fact that this organization and its affiliates operate very openly within the, the state. I think to the annoyance of some of, some of my uh, friends in the counterterrorism community, uh, I've sort of long pressed to, to focus, uh, at least to some extent, on these public activities because it moves the conversation from the cloak and dagger world of intelligence, uh, which operative is doing what, uh, and it, it, in fact, even moves the conversation from the world of legalisms, uh, which designated individual did which thing in violation of international law, to a conversation about what we can all observe very publicly, the operation, the recruitment of, of this organization. And I, I like to think that a lot of what is documented in this book reinforces an argument for engaging the public dimensions of Lashkar Taiba and its affiliates, because it focuses on just how important the wider social context is to the organization. They, uh, their most effective fighters, at least, are recruited from Punjab. They rely on family assent in order to recruit. Uh, the narratives of legitimacy are important, the public narratives that are reinforced by the affiliate organizations. And so even if you set aside the very tricky questions of does the state have directive control and how does funding work, <coughs> In reading this book, you can't really escape the argument that the state's public support and public space available to the organization matters for its ability to recruit and operate and thrive. And therefore, degrading that support, uh, to some extent, has to be valuable. And that's not to say that it would have immediate operational effects, but it does reinforce to me that this is, uh, this is an organization not like Al-Qaeda that exists in secret cells that we can't see but one that's deeply socially embedded. And that there are things that the organization is doing very visibly that could be curtailed. And this is why I think some of the actions in the um, financial action task force that the US government is pursuing to look at the very obvious things that the organization is doing and to hold Pakistan to account for those things um, has some value, even if it doesn't operationally degrade the group in, in the short term. The, the last thing I would say is that uh, the last chapter of this book is, is very provocative, uh, but I think also very, very honest in which Chris uh, wrestles with what policy prescriptions might, might work. Um, looking at uh, sort of a, a status quo option in which 
uh, India, the United States, and, and other, other friends essentially accept the costs uh, of lashkar e taibas activity, of its militancy or, or terrorism, and reckon those costs to be acceptable costs given the larger objectives that India has uh, and the United States. A second option being uh, leadership decapitation, which, uh, which may be effective but comes at significant uh, costs. Um, and the third being, um, I, don't, I forget how you characterize it, but a more, uh, escalation, uh, escalating coercion to pressure the Pakistani state to, um, to deal with this group or to come to, to a reckoning. My own view is that there's probably very little that we can do to force a reckoning, and at best there are things that we might do that would accelerate a reckoning, but those come with costs. And I would just say, um, from a policy point of view, having seen a little bit of this, at any given moment, the United States has six or seven things that it wants from Pakistan. And you can think about avoiding nuclear escalation. You can think about nuclear safety and security, which I would break out into a separate category. Terrorism against the United States. Terrorism against India. Terrorism targeted toward Afghanistan. Pakistan's uh, general dispensation toward Afghanistan. And then you have humanitarian and economic interests. Um, and it seems to me that the United States puts uh, the question of Lashkar-e Taiba and Jaishi Muhammad not at the top of that list, not at the bottom, but usually somewhere in the third or fourth quartile. And given its placement in the hierarchy of, of U.S. interests, the um, strategy of escalating coercion is, I think, at this moment when Afghanistan is, again, at the top of that list, um, unlikely to be very palatable, uh, particularly coercive measures that are focused on this particular uh, problem set as opposed to ones that are focused on uh, Pakistan's actions vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. So that's not, a, that's not a pleasant way to conclude, but I think it's a sort of looking at the, the hierarchy of interest and where this particular problem, this very vexing problem, um, sits within that interest. But please go buy the book because it's, it's uh, even richer than, than what you heard here today uh, and even deeper. And also just said, I'm donating all of the proceeds, my personal proceeds, to Indian victims of Indian victims of terrorism. Um, so buying the book will also help a good cause. Bobby? Yes, I'm actually very pleased to be here to give, make a few comments on this book. I read the book once, and then I read the book again, because I felt as though I, on the first time through, I couldn't possibly have caught the entire richness. I rarely do that, in all honesty. Uh, and I, I just found it fascinating. We've touched on several dimensions of the book, uh, including the fascinating emphasis uh, in a major part of the book on the domestic roots and the domestic consequences uh, of those roots um, for both Pakistani society and the LET organization itself. And I, I won't repeat some of the themes that have already been brought out. So let me just touch on a couple of um, thoughts that take us a little bit outside the book, but then bring us back in to the themes that, uh, that Chris has, has so ably uh, brought out. First of all, I, I asked myself after I read the last chapter of the book, well, looking beyond LET in Pakistan, how do militancies end? Militancies anywhere end. What are some of the, the roots, as in R-O-U-T-E, not the other kind, um, by which, um, for example, the IRA uh, becomes more of a political force, although tugging at the pant legs of the IRA leadership are younger people who wish this hadn't happened, that the IRA were still fighting. And we can't say that some of these may not be reborn. But the one answer that seems common to all of these ending stories where they have ended uh, is they end messily. And I wanted just to highlight a couple of messinesses that might result from any of the efforts to decrease LET's activities um, internally and externally. So I, I wanted to start with decapitation. Um, because I had a fair amount of experience looking at the effects of decapitation on um, 
uh, uh, counter uh, narcotics in, on several continents. So if you decapitate a major drug group, and of course the parallel is that really well-organized um, drug lords uh, uh, exercise a tremendous influence culturally and politically in the areas where they work and on the leaders of whatever countries they operate in or next to. So what did our decapitation, our meaning US, um, decapitation uh, strategy do? It immediately brought forth other groups that were waiting in the wings. Everybody said, these are all very hierarchical groups. So you take out the leader, you take out the group. Well, that's true for a while um, until they grow a, a new leader. But in the meantime, other groups jump in, in maybe from other bases and take that space and move with it. And if you think about what we've heard uh, regarding the groups that are the counterweight for LET, just thinking about the Pakistani ones without even adding uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, or whatever, we're, we're talking about the Deobandi groups, and wh which are considerably less tolerant and more likely to foment uh, disarray than array within Pakistan. So that's a, a problem that immediately arises uh, if we think about a decapitation strategy. I was fascinated um, to follow up on your points about the formation or the greater attention being given to LET as a political party, even though that hasn't really taken off. Uh, again, that brought me back to Irish and other uh, examples. And of course, the, the, um, the excuse me, the wisdom in Pakistan, which I've been hearing since before 9-11, is that if you decommissioned LET, if the government stopped supporting them uh, and ordered them to the bench, they would turn, a, they, they basically would become uh, gangsters. Um, they, they have capabilities, particularly the fighters. The fighters are not used to sitting on their hands. We uh, read in Chris's book and we've read elsewhere that when after 2001, after the uh, attack on India's parliament, the Pakistan military told LET to stand down for a, a time. LET, LET was divided on this issue. There were some in LET who said, we ought to go against the government. This is unacceptable. They can't make us stand down when we have a, um, a huge uh, issue to pursue and this could even be an opportunity. That was Jaish. Was it? Yeah, and that's what precipitated the split of Jaish. Right. But it's the same story. It was the same story. The in same fact, story. I actually heard it at the time. I'm confusing that with what you put in your book. Um, but that, that was an important um, discussion, and I actually had the, um, the privilege of talking with somebody, a Pakistani gentleman who was very close to what this book makes clear is a um, a, a scene between uh, ISI and LET, a very close one that even includes um, the um, intelligence people being involved in supplementing what LET pays to the families of Shaheed. So when you start looking again at that, the possibility of really angering those um, devoted fighters who are, represent the pointy end of a large organization with many other uh, missions. Um, that, that's, that's a challenge. It's a challenge that I think most Pakistanis, even Pakistanis who um, believe that LET is in the employ of uh, Pakistan military uh, intelligence in particular, uh, and that this is uh, counterproductive for Pakistan, uh, would have to choke on. You know, how, do you, how do you get these guys decommissioned on a longer basis without their becoming, as their counterparts have in a number of other countries, an internal security problem of a different sort? Uh, I have done some comparative work on um, the end of militancies in South America and in Africa, and that has always been a big challenge. Most of the, uh, the first consequence is that uh, they start 
replacing their, uh, their earlier income by uh, going out on more entrepreneurial uh, bases and they become an internal security problem of a different flavor. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on a strand of something you mentioned in your book, which I found really interesting. And that is the extremely limited information um, channels that are acceptable um, in L.E.T., um, culturally L.E.T. dominated uh, villages and L.E.T. families. Uh, and that they, they aren't supposed to watch TV, they aren't supposed to, and what in effect is happening is that uh, the L.E.T. narrative is reinforced in part by the absence of any contradictory information. And so one question I have, and I know it's very difficult when people have grown up entirely in an ambiance with a narrative that is self-reinforcing uh, in all the ways um, that are, they have access to uh, the public domain. Is there some way to begin to inject um, other, other approaches to the same problems? I doubt very much that simple propaganda, the sorts of things that um, public diplomacy does, uh, will, would even nick the, this influence and begin to open things up. But there might be some more thought about that, just opening up the, the apertures around Pakistan to other Pakistani narratives. There are other Pakistani narratives. So I will um, stop my comments here, uh, except to, to agree with the somewhat pessimistic conclusion of my colleagues here about the US ability to influence Pakistan to get rid of L.E.T. for all the reasons that each of us has discussed. I don't think that's a successful strategy. We can't buy a change of heart on this. It's deeply embedded, and the social embedment is the greatest obstacle of all. Thank you, Polly. I would recommend one. I, I would recommend that all of you read the book and buy the book uh, for the reasons that Chris uh, mentioned as well. But the one thing that struck me about the book, which is worth looking at, is the enormous amount of detail that Chris has been able to mine from literature that L.E.T. has put out over the years. I mean, it's it's really quite remarkable. And I remember from our RAND days when Chris would go to Pakistan, she would come back with boxes full of everything from posters to pamphlets. And obviously there was an enormous amount of data and those of us who were focused only on the more rarefied sources missed this entirely. And it's really wonderful to see in this book that Chris has been able to mine that subterranean literature to sort of tell a story at a much, with much greater texture than you know, the international relations literature otherwise does. I want to open the uh, floor to your comments and questions, but I do want to ask one question of all our panelists if, if they want to answer it. Chris, from your book and from your presentation, I got the very strong sense that L.E.T. objectives and Pakistani state objectives are very closely aligned. But are they perfectly congruent? So are we really talking of a group that is a wholly owned subsidiary in functional terms? Or is there some room for a principal agent problem that could be exploited down the line? Now, obviously, in the here and now, it may be hard. But it bears in the question that Polly and uh, Josh raised, which is, as this group evolves, is there any possibility that a delta might open up between their own objectives and the objectives of the state? And does that off offer some opportunities with respect to so there, so there is an anecdote, but then I, I very much agree with Polly. Which way will this principal agent problem that might open up redound to the advantage of India and the United States or the disadvantage? So there's one really important vignette. And this was after, it, went, it was very similar to what Jaish went through. So, so the reason, so Jaish, for those of you who don't know, um, in, uh, there, there was an Indian hijacking in 19, it was the very end of 1999, and the Pakistanis had been trying to uh, get 
some factions of these Dale Bundy groups, Harkatul Ansar, Harkatul uh, Mujahideen, Huji, it's, all of these are Dale Bundy groups. They, the ISI will both prop up and undermine these different Dale Bundy groups as a way of managing their aggregation of powers. It's one of the ways which they divide and conquer, divide and rule. So they, or, the ISI orchestrated a hijacking of this plane from Kathmandu. They had a very horrific, circuitous route, but it ultimately ended in Kandahar. And the Indian government traded several high-value terrorists, one of whom was Masood Azhar, who set up Jaish. Another was Daniel Pearl, who, or, <laughs> Daniel Pearl, the murderer of, of, of Daniel Pearl, uh, Sheikh Omar, in exchange for the surviving passengers. Now, the reason why Kandahar was so important was that these guys had very good ties with the Taliban for reasons that, that I had noted. And with ISI assistance, they go into Pakistan a few weeks later, uh, Jaish pops up, right? So Jaish, when 9-11 happened and we invaded Afghanistan, Jaish immediately flipped on the state because from their point of view, the Taliban were the only emirate that followed Dale Bundy prescriptions of Sharia, Obviously, there were problems because it was more Pashtun, but it doesn't matter. They immediately split. And Jaish went and ratted on them, which is why Jaish becomes this protective, uh, Masood Azhar becomes this protected character of the state, does everything it can to, to build him up because he becomes an important uh, strategy in Pakistan's effort to put down the Pakistan Taliban, which actually begins with this initial break in Jaish. So this is a whole other story about a whole other organization. But a similar debate happens with Lashkar at Taiba, right? The argument, and, and they're getting pressure from their cadre. You know, right now, the great Satan is in Afghanistan. Why aren't we fighting the great Satan? Now, Lashkar knows that for it to operate in Afghanistan, it has to be co-located with these Dale Bundys in, in the tribal areas. And the Dale Bundys are in many ways its organizational nemesis, right? So they make this decision just to sort of let off the steam that if you want to go fight in Afghanistan, they're going to be very limited targets, right? You're going to go after the Indian embassies, the Indian consulates, some Americans. You know, essentially, you become a, uh, you'll become a functional, interchangeable player with the Haqqani network. When you really want a high-value target with probability of success being high, send one of these guys in. But it's really a valve, and it's really being driven by Luxie. Luxie is really a problem. But then, so we go back and people ask, why did, why did the Pakistani state do Mumbai? Um, and so, by the way, there's a movie out about this. I'm going to see it tonight with, with Spouse Jay. Y'all should see it, Hotel Mumbai, about the, about the hotel attack. Well, this is a very propitious attack. In retrospect, we see that from the ISI's point of view, this solves a whole lot of problems. One, Pakistanis were really getting exhausted with the operations against the tribal elements. And you see this in the public polling, but they're also very exhausted with the, with the Pakistan Taliban itself. And this becomes, this peaks actually in 2009 after the attack. Well, what this attack does is that it gives the, the militants in Pakistan a chance to throw up a we support you flag. Kayani actually says of the head of the Pakistani Taliban who offered a ceasefire that this dude is a patriot, right? It also gives the opportunity for the Pakistani military to swing from the looking west towards Afghanistan and these very unpopular operations to swing towards the east, which traditionally have a lot of support. It also reminds Pakistanis of the really terrible Indian nemesis, and we need to be unified, and therefore it revivifies their ability to go knock heads, right? So it does all these things. But most importantly, it gives them an excuse to put Lakfi in prison. Lakfi was the turd story, or as I like to say in Hindi, the, the Tutti Hilvani. He was the one causing a lot of grief for the organization. So they put Lakfi, who's basically the fall guy, and they put him in protective custody in jail, right? But protective custody allows him to do the things that the state wants him to do, but it limits his ability to do the Tutti Hilvani <coughs> that he had been doing about fighting in Afghanistan. So going to your point and to your question, Ashley, there is. But is this a good thing? Unless, that's why, now going to the leadership decapitation, I take all of your points, Polly, but there's a difference between them and the, IR, and, the, and the IRA. This is a proxy, right? And I say pretty clearly in the book that, that you don't, there's really nothing you can do to make this group go away. There's this fascinating debate in the literature about target substitution. 
right? When a terrorist group can no longer effectively operate, um, it, what it'll do is it will substitute to other targets. And we've seen this with the Pakistan Taliban, right? Thanks to the drones, um, alhamdulillah, peace be upon them. The Pakistan Taliban ceased to be able to go after core commanders. They ceased to go after ISI headquarters. And instead, they began going after domestic targets. So what you've essentially done is that you've switched the targeting from security targets to civilians. You've basically switched the cost. Like that's called target substitution. So you're, you're, you don't get rid of the qual you don't get rid of the terrorism, but you you degrade the quality of terror, right? So I'm very realistic about this. But LET is so different because you can tell from their organization they've got like a handful of dudes. I mean, they're it, it's like musical chairs, but you never take a chair out, right? So uh, unlike the Dale Bundy organizations that work as networks of networks and they do this to protect against leadership decapitation, the impunity of JUD suggests a lot of scope to, for, at least in the near term, to degrade their capabilities. Does this fix the problems that Polly identified? No, but I'm really straightforward in the book that given the realities and the, let's talk about principal agent problem and, and, and free writing, there's, they're never gonna have a consortium of, of states, for one reason, China is all, and, and now increasingly Russia is carrying water for Pakistan. All we're really left with is mowing the lawn. Right, that's really all we can do. And so if you're an Indian, and, I, and some people don't like this comparison, in contrast, every single day is a massacre on the streets. Same thing for here. Actually, when you normalize for population, our fatality on roads are, are really quite similar, right? But we don't politicize street fatalities, even though road fatalities are something that a government can control to a much greater extent than terrorism fatalities, right? So if you were to look at this as the cost of prosperity, right? The other option is doing what we've seen with this, this, with this current government, right? Which is, you know, try to impose a cost. But even after Balakot, I submit to you, and we don't know what did or did not happen at Balakot, this isn't enough to make Pakistan decide that, oh, oh, okay, because India may or may not have sent some mirages across the LSC and may or may not have blown up Balakot, we're gonna stop using these guys. Absolutely not. And, the, and going to your point about not propaganda, I have to tell you, I've become a pessimist about this. Because Pakistan is narratively a self-licking ice cream cone. Like, look at Balako. Those dudes manage to, to basically seize a victory out of the jaws of defeat, right? And when I meet Pakistani students, I, just, I was just at Columbia on Friday discussing this book. When you tell them that the cherished, fiction, the cherished fictions that they have learned from a curriculum that has been deliberately aligned with the ideology of the state, that something isn't true, they don't believe you. It's a and the, this is where the conspiracy theories are quite interesting. They'll always deploy a conspiracy theory. The conspiracy theory, and this has actually prepared me to understand the time of Trump, right, and my own Americans. I'm from Indiana. Conspiracy theory is not to tell you what the truth is. It is to simply destabilize what you say the truth is, right? And we will never have the cultural expertise to outrun the ISI in Pakistan. They have defeated us every single time, whether it was the Kerry Luga, the way they run the, the info ops on the drones. I can't think of a single time when we've actually, and the, the few times that we thought we have done info ops well, when I pointed out to them, you don't understand what's happening. We, we, were, we were subsidizing these films to be made by ISPR. One of them was uh, translated as God hasn't, left, God hasn't yet abandoned us. And we thought that this was great because we were encouraging people to support the POC military operations. What the lovely geniuses at the, the mist cell in, the Islamabad, in, in Islamabad missed was that the film is actually causing, was promoting people to support these military operations because they were arguing that these militants were proxies of India. And when I pointed out the really important first two minutes of the show, they're like, oh, we totally didn't catch that. Right? So, I don't know. Want to weigh in on this? Okay. okay. Let me take two questions at a time because I'm conscious of time. So, Tazy, please. There's a micro microphone. It's a remarkable account of the sort of thing I think you do best, Chris. So, thank you for that. I was struck by the education table 
but I wonder if you've got data to take that a little bit further. Geographically, where do these guys come from? Where are they strongest? Um, sociologically, I mean, the educational figures would suggest that you're talking about middle class, maybe lower middle class, but is that what you actually found? Oh, where do they otherwise fit into Pakistani society? Do any of these dudes um, start out with ambitions other than killing people, or are there other things in their world which might give them ambitions other than killing people? Yes, sir. Thanks, Jonathan Lande with Reuters. After Pawama, the United States seemed to change its policy towards Pakistan, where once upon a time we heard administrations pass talk about both sides needing to exercise restraint. You then heard this administration uh, talk about the Indians' right to, to um, self-defense, and that last part, self-restraint, was missing. But we also heard them talking about Pakistan needing to, to take, quote, sustained, irreversible, unquote, actions against the proxy groups that it sponsors. Um, are those just, based on what you, you all are saying, it sounds like those are just more empty words from an American administration. And if so, to what extent, uh, based on the historical record, will those actually end up encouraging uh, and fanning uh, the use of these groups by Pakistan. All right, so to go to Tazy's question. Oh, um, I, I, I'm not sure how I lost the connection here, but I'll show you. Here's here's the um, here's the map. I don't I don't know how to bring it back online. Yeah. So okay, remember. The authors of these biographies, unfortunately, did not have my checklist of data elements. <laughs> so not all of the biographies, you know, and we can't have a seance to you know, ask these dudes after the fact, uh, hey, what did you do? So we are really, uh, we are uh, hostages to what the biographies say. Um, and I didn't take everything that the biography said as, as Quranic truth. So one of the things that you'll find is like, you know, this fellow, you know, uh, he, he single-handedly killed 150 Kufar, you know, with a single pea shooter. So I don't take those things at face value, but I did take things like where are they from, what was their education, how many siblings did they have, uh, were they married? Those were generally an, an employment. Those are the kinds of things that we generally got. So this tells you that they, and as I said in my talk, 10, 10 districts account for the majority of these guys, and they're all in the Punjab. But, the, but what we do get, um, and by the way, so I'm, doing, I'm working right now on the, the sequel to this, which is where I'm publishing with a colleague of mine of, of an annotated translation of the things that I use to write this book. And we'll be using some of these biographies. But what do we get from them? There's a, they fall into a couple of themes. The first is that they look a lot, these young men, and they're all men, look a lot like the young men that my brothers recruit in the US Army. My brothers are recruiters. And at this point, some people get really angry at me. Um, I, and I, organizationally, they're doing the same thing. They're, they're manning a mission. The boys will talk about um, they are bored. There's just, there's got to be something else in this world waiting for them. By the way, my brothers talk the same way. It's like. You know, there's a, the army has this bumper sticker, join the US Army, meet interesting people, and kill them, right? So I find, engaged in these biographies, they are much more similar to any other, milit milit uh, any other violent organization recruiting people. You also get the sense, just as we do in the US Army, no one, very few people come in actually wanting to kill people. This is something that you're taught to do, right? My, when my brother, both my brothers joined the army at 16, the idea of killing someone was not on their, they went for other reasons, adventure, education. You see this happening within LET. There's, and this is why the, a lot of scholars have moved away from the radicalization literature. They're not radical when they join, right? They're taught to kill once they are in. So you do see in these biographies, and the, and the parent will talk about the restlessness of the kid, that the kid wanted to be something greater than 
uh, working in the CD shop of his uncle. This is a very common theme. Now, uh, then you have, um, and this is also something that you see with, with US military recruitment. There's some kid you meet in high school, he's got this great plan, hey, come talk to a recruiter, he can get you in too. You'll see a lot of friends pulling people into the organization. And um, the, the kid will remark, well, you know, since uh, my friend joined this organization, he's much more focused, he's a better person, he's more caring, He's a better son. Um, I want to be that. And then so, and then we're just moving sort of along the religious motivations. Then you get to, and, there, and this is, uh, someone points out how slutty their mothers and sisters are. That they're running around, they're not covered, they shop by themselves, they hang out with their friends, they're texting meaty boys, and the boy is, in, is infuriated that their mothers are, are, and sisters are acting like such hussies. And Lushker becomes a way where they're exerting control over their females and their families. You also have women that are disgusted with the immoral behavior of their sons, husbands, and uncles. And they become part of Lushker to exert control over them. So what I see in these biographies is a whole lot of agency. What I don't see is, oh, these are a bunch of brainwashed idiots who had no other opportunities. It ever, and which is why I don't like the word radical. I see at every point the people in my biographies making decisions. And they're not just making decisions on their own, they're making decisions in the context of a society. Every once in a while we see a sociopath. Why do I say a sociopath? There's one mother who, who is missing her son. He had such a great sense of humor and what was some of the funny things that he liked to do was kill animals and torture local children with. Um, so I, I find there's this, now then there's this whole other thing which is, which is just genuinely uh, Islamic in the Pakistani sense, which is the young boy, he, he wants to save his family, both in this life by encouraging them to live better, but then also he wants to intervene on their, in their behalf. And, and he'll, you'll see the boy telling his parents, I'm going to go to Allah to bring you with me. Don't make me look like a fool. So you have this whole range of motivations that, that I think um, it is really important, and I have a much larger study of just these motivations that I'm working on as well. Going to Lande's point, so actually Lande, the U.S. narrative shifted after Uri, right? I noticed that, in, uh, which was in 2016. After Uri, there was no more of those both sidisms. And okay, personally, I think that was a very important move because what Pakistan all Pakistan knows it's not going to get Kashmir. I mean, you know, if you ever get a chance to talk to Musharraf or JK or anyone else, like they'll tell you, we're not going to get it. We have, to take these, we have to take these calculated risks so that India doesn't think that they've defeated us and that we've rolled over. Like, you know, Pakistan's a weeble. It wobbles, but it doesn't fall down. So what it does get out of these things, and what it historically got was, you know, a time headline, most dangerous place on the earth, a bunch of ill-informed uh, presidents, prime ministers, saying the same, you know, the, the, the both sides, we need to resolve X, Y, Z, and ultimately legitimizing Pakistan's equity in the dispute, right? So I think, actually, that this narrative shift that actually began in 2016 in Ori in, in, um, in, in is an important part of depriving Pakistan of what it so desires, which is bestowing legitimacy. Now when uh, Malia Lodi gets up and you know, opines about Kashmir, people are more likely to simply sneer at her than they are to, yes, 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 va, 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 right? So I think depriving Pakistan of that legitimacy is a really important step in explaining to Pakistan that we are going to deny you the dividends of your terrorism. And this is one of their important terror dividends, is this uh, resolve your disputes, which leg legitimizes their story. Say something to this. Yeah, uh, no, I, I largely agree with uh, with Chris on that, and the the timing as well with the the shift after Uri. I would say that the uh, that notwithstanding the way in which this administration, after the most recent attack, managed the the aftermath, was disconcerting to me. Um, in that it seemed to me to telegraph to India in a way that I you know, entirely understand, uh, you get one really good punch. Right? Which I and, totally support. And, That's interesting that you well, And yeah. I was like, I just wanted them to make that punch count more. <laughs> right, well, and, and I, I think that the, uh, and after that one really good punch, then the rhetoric shifted to uh, both sides should de-escalate and um, 
uh, India sh Pakistan should not get a counter counter punch, if you will. Um, and I think that this was very understandable from the perspective of the U.S.-India relationship, its trajectory. Uh, there's a certain catharsis to it. But I think, uh, from my perspective, if you weigh what India is likely to gain from such a punch, which is, in my view, mostly political catharsis, and the risks that we, um, the risks that we are implicitly enabling of escalation between both countries, I think there was a, an off-ramp that happened in this crisis that we can't count on in every crisis. That might not be a, a sustainable uh, policy prescription. It might not be a sustainable wager. The other thing I would say to the second part of your question about sustained, irreversible uh, action, uh, I'm, I'm all for sus sustained action against LET. I think irreversible is probably a nonsensical rhetorical <laughs> flourish by a US government official. Uh, almost nothing is irreversible. And in fact, this gets back to the, the problem I mentioned in my earlier comments about the public and non-public dimensions of this group's activities and that of its affiliates. Uh, it's very difficult to see what happens within the small core of the group's operatives, their preparation, their activities, and the degree, if any, of directive control by the state over those activities. And there's a very large public dimension of what we can see, which is, in fact, quite elaborate um, and if uh, growing, right? And so to some extent, what, what I have argued is that the United States should say to Pakistan that um, it recognizes that if, if Pakistan were to dismantle, try to dismantle the group in one fell swoop, there would indeed be blowback, there would be all sorts of substitution effects and, and challenges, but that at the very least, we should be seeing the state trying to systematically reduce the, dom the public domain of activities that provides this apparatus of support, of social support and institutions, the, from the political party to the relief organization to the institution. Don't just change the leadership of the institutions, close the institutions. And that in doing so, this might not get to the operational activities immediately, but it's something that would be visible. It's something that over time would have a cumulative effect given the sort of deep social fabric and it would begin to signal that, that this group is not a legitimate actor in the eyes of the state. Those are the things that are actually possible to do without blowback, and those are the things that we're not seeing. We and, can and go further. I mean, oh, you, no, absolutely. I mean, take this is away a, the friggin' Punjab police protecting them. Right? Right. You've there seen are, their Twitter you know, feed. There are, there are train, public yeah. trains that take them yes. to, to the rallies. And th this sort of the, take the budgetary the support away from them. <laughs> right. it's, they have support in the Punjab budget. <laughs> and so, in, in in that sense, I'm 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 s sympathetic to the fact that a a hammer blow would potentially be very difficult for the state. But my my view, just to conclude, is that when the Pakistani state has decided that a group is is uh, needs to be dealt with, it has shown itself very capable of dealing with that group along the full spectrum of operations, from delegitimizing them, to defunding them, to uh, undercutting them, to substituting them. We saw, saw this with the, and, and with the, the Tikka Taban, and worse, and right? And so I'm fully capable that it can begin that process in a way that is visible and sustained, even if nothing is irreversible. Okay, we've got uh, one, two. Let's see, I want to try and give all of you a chance. So why don't the two of you quickly and keep your answers on the panel as succinct as possible. <laughs> so we can. Um, my name is uh, Fati. I'm Cindy uh, from Cindy American Pack. Um, um, my focus is more on the human rights and the important role they play um, on daily basis because I am from Sindh, and uh, especially the forced conversions and how ISI is closely working with these people who are very much involved. So it's like two girls uh, every day being falsely converted and abducted. So my focus is more of human rights, how America can put more pressure on human rights levels. Thank you. Jalil Afridi from the Frontier Post. Um, one is that I feel like you are trying to give an impression that there is nothing wrong in Kashmir. Don't you think there is something wrong in Kashmir from the Indian side as well? And second is, I'm really hurt with the fact that twice on two occasions, you made a satire on the Islamic words with very negative things. You said, inshallah, on a negative thing. 
and you said alhamdulillah on a negative thing. But what, For a what, professor you know, like you, it doesn't, I don't think it's nice to make fun of religion in a, in, in a gathering. I'm not like making this, fun know? of religion. I'm making been here fun for three of. Years. I have never uh, heard anybody say funny things about somebody's religion. It's not about. It's it's, it's, I'm sorry. Ter 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 terrorism is not religion. But, but let me so let me. Don't say alhamdulillah Chris, on it. Chris. Can we just? Alhamdulillah, I'm, you're saying. I mean. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for your point. Doesn't look nice on a television. Let's. We, we can. You and I can discuss these. Personally. Let's go to the Kashmir issue. Yeah. All right. And and by the way, I'm. Let's talk about PTM. It's a perfectly good example of of a state. Uh, using everything at its disposal, including lethal violence, to, to degrade a group's effectiveness. So this idea that it can't, I'm not persuaded by. This is not a conversation about India and about India-Kashmir, but I'm very glad that you raised the issue of Kashmir because there's, there's actually three pieces of Kashmir, right? There's the Pakistan-administered Kashmir, and it has an appalling human rights record, to be completely blunt with you. The place has zero development. They've basically kept that place as a petting zoo for the launching of terrorist operations into India. Let's also talk about the part of Kashmir that was illegal, illegally ceded to China. What's the human rights situation there, right? What, what part of China did that fall into? Remind me again, okay? You know where I'm going with this, right? So if we were to talk about what India is doing in Kashmir, I appreciate your sentiment. I have never shirked from criticizing India's appalling human rights record. I have never shirked from criticizing Major Gogoi. From, and you know this because you are on LinkedIn, you see my post. I'm, and, and not only was he not punished, he was accoladed by the army chief. So sir, your question I have to say is disingenuous. Anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I will not shirk from criticizing those things. However, Pakistan, as you also know, has put India deliberately in a very bad situation. Pakistan knows that India has to maintain a large counterinsurgency grid because of the incessant threat of Pakistan-sponsored terrorism. This is why it is so easy for Pakistan to pay a youth 500 rupees to throw a rock at a police officer with full knowledge that there's a very large probability that at least one of those rock throwers will be killed. So I will say to you, sir, and I don't care if it offends you, the only Kashmiri Pakistan cares about is a dead Kashmiri. If Pakistan cares about Kashmir, it will stop using terrorism. This will allow Delhi and Srinagar to sort out their very real problems. That cannot happen until Pakistan stops the terrorism habit. You want to take the second question on human I won't, because human rights, I don't think we have a lot of hammer there. But I will tell you, Lashkar yeah, is. Yes, they are. They are, and they're, yes. And, and also to convert Hindus. And so they actually have a couple of Hindus from TAR who's become a JUD spokesperson um, because they're investing, because of the water problems with the tube wells, and of course it's, you know, the environment itself is not very water friendly. They've been investing in, um, in well infrastructure, and they are very explicit about using social welfare to convert Sindhi Hindus. They also are, um, in many cases, the sole provider of medical care. Now, of course, the state's doing this by choice, right? The state could provide those things, but the state actually wants LET in this role. Uh, in the same way that uh, JUD and its uh, humanitarian outfits are the sole source provider um, of earthquake relief, for example, in Balochistan. So this goes back to my argument about them being a domestic partner. They have a fascinating treatment, though, of, of Hindus. Uh, the, uh, the leadership has been very clear that they cannot be killed, that even though they are the greatest of polytheists, right, they're the greatest of Kufar, within Pakistan, they can only be converted. And so, by the way, they, they have a very similarly sophisticated take on Emides, right? Because I, if you ask them to articulate their view, they won't say that they're Kali Mago, but they're not going to advocate killing them either. So I agree with you, but going to your larger point, I haven't seen evidence that the United States is able to do anything on, on human rights issues, in, in part because it's, it doesn't really rank you know, as Josh said, there's all these other things that 
to kind of rank higher. But I'm, I'm not going to comment on it further. I'll take the last two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Peter Humphrey, intel analyst and a former diplomat. Uh, of course, these operations have killed plenty of Muslims, and it's wonderful to see them uh, ignoring those collateral damage. Uh, bigger question, though, is those who do interview these people find that, almost without exception, uh, operations are signed off by some cleric. And um, to the extent that we've even seen operations delayed waiting for the clerical fatwa, um, that means the center of gravity here is ISI funding and the imprimatur of certain clerics. Where's the naming, shaming, and targeting of these clerics? Well, that does not apply to yes, this let organization. Just, let me just take the last question as well. Yes. Uh, my name is uh, Malika Wan, and uh, I'm executive member of uh, Republican uh, National Committee. And uh, my uh, question is not based on my personal views and opinions, uh, but uh, our large uh, Indian American diaspora living in the United States. Uh, there's uh, one book uh, published uh, from uh, Canada, uh, The Betrayal of uh, uh, India by an author uh, named Elias uh, Jefferson. And in the, if you read that book, actually it's very much discussed uh, today on Twitter and on various uh, social media platforms. And uh, in that book, uh, the author is an investigative journalist, and he has given some proofs in which uh, he, according to the author, that Indian intelligence uh, itself is involved into the Mumbai attacks, and uh, they have received the benefits by the hike in military budget at uh, 21%, and certain benefits. Thank you. So, so to your point, sir, you, this the point that you raise really follows more the Deo Bundy groups. Um, the again, but even they have they're like a self licking ice cream cone, right? Because they have madrasas and they have mosques and they have ulama that are sympathetic. Now they don't actually have to bless every single operation. So one of the most important things was, for example, blessing suicide operations. Because this was something where there was a lot of debate amongst different um, ulama or, or alams. We saw in Afghanistan, and we also saw in Pakistan, when the ulama refused to agree that suicide operations are halal, um, that they were killed. So one of the issues that one has in this approach that you're adopting is that unless you're willing to provide security for those alums that will delegitimize certain kinds of violence, you provide them with no incentive to do that. Conversely, if you do provide them with security, you take away their legitimacy because now they look like a paid alum, right? So it's, I am very sympathetic to your point, um, but I think it's much harder to do than, than what you're suggesting. With LET, it doesn't matter because they have already broken away from the LA Hadith uh, ulama, because the LA Hadith ulama have already said what this organization does is not halal. Going to your point, sir, um, I don't think everything is worth reading. I don't think everything is worth believing having read it. I will point you to a more credible volume, and that is a book written by Avinash Paliwal. Some time ago in 2008, I caused a bit of a controversy by stating what I thought was a, a fairly basic truth. Um, India has done intelligence operations in Afghanistan. It has done intelligence operations in Balochistan. Uh, and I think the best account of those, which draw from raw interviews, other intelligence operatives, my only grouse about it is relies too heavily upon interviews, and it doesn't rely upon um, other information that could buttress those interviews. But Avinash Paliwal's uh, book is absolutely superb. It is, it is unflinching. Um, in, in sort of describing what India has done. But sir, this book that you just described, um, I, I, I'm profoundly offended that anyone would take that, would take that credibly. I wasn't um, describing your book. I was not you, no, not you, him, sir. <laughs> him. I mean, you know, as you know, um, as you know, Americans and Israelis and many Indians died in that attack. 
to say that Indian intelligence was behind it, that this was a false flag operation, I think kind of insults our collective intelligence and it also insults my sense of a human, my, my sense of morality. But we'll agree to disagree. Now, I was, any last thought? <laughs> well, I, I do want to second your, uh, your view on, on Mumbai and to say that um, enough of the joint British, American, Israeli, Indian um, forensic investigation uh, after the fact, uh, not to mention the confessions of the surviving uh, member of the LET team, really, as far as I can see, completely negates uh, what, what in you- the public in, domain. In the pub this is in the public domain. Enough of it was out in the public domain to, uh, I think, uh, make that really quite clear. Now, David Heedley Coleman was a more complicated fellow. That's a more complicated But that does not story. involve Indian intelligence. That's on us. Nope. Well, I want to take the opportunity on behalf of all of you to thank uh, our three panelists today, and especially Chris for having taken the time to walk us through the book. Uh, do we have, there are copies of, uh, on sale outside if you want to pick one up. But in any event, thank you for coming this morning. I look forward to seeing you again uh, at the Carnegie Endowment. And thank you for being such an active audience <laughs> with your thoughts, your questions, and your queries. And thank you to all our panelists. So.